a week before his resurrection, and just days before his crucifixion, Jesus entered the holy city of Jerusalem. He did not enter that city like a king. There was no chariot, there was no mighty horse. He entered that city on a donkey. Outside the city, the crowds gathered around to see their king, and they laid their palm branches on the dusty road, and they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna simply means God save us. And that simple prayer echoes across time. 2,000 years ago, the Jerusalem crowds shouted Hosanna to their king on that dusty road. And 2,000 years later, wherever we are, we shout Hosanna, even still. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna in the lowest moments. Hosanna in the green pastures. Hosanna in the darkest valleys. Hosanna in the crowded cities. Hosanna in the open spaces. Hosanna in every church. Hosanna in every home. Hosanna in the victories. Hosanna in the failures. Hosanna in the beautiful beginnings and Hosanna in the bitter endings. Hosanna in the days of trial. Hosanna in the days of plenty. Hosanna in the days of sadness. Hosanna in the days of celebration. Hosanna in the morning and Hosanna in the evening. Hosanna in the sunshine and darkness. Hosanna in the years of waiting. Hosanna in the seasons of blessing. Hosanna all the time. Hosanna everywhere. Hosanna forever. Hosanna to the sun. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, save us now. Anyone grateful for the saving grace of God through Jesus Christ? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And uh, this morning, I, I just want to draw our attention to Jesus appropriately and fittingly every Sunday. Amen. And uh, just the heart of the Lord. I, I just couldn't help but come to this word this week that Jesus was so compelled to go to Jerusalem uh, that that Sunday, I, just days later, knowing that he would face Calvary's hill, a crucifixion, and he, and he was driven. To be compelled is to be driven, is to be motivated, having a strong sense of motivation. I'm sure we can all think of some things that drive us or motivate us. You probably have some things that compel you to do some things, to say some things, uh, pursue some things. I'm sure you're compelled to purchase some things, and then maybe wish you could return some things. I personally, this morning, make a declaration that I aim to be compelled to be more like Jesus and compelled by the things that motivated Jesus. And, and my prayer for you today is that you will join me in being compelled to be like him and to be motivated with, mo with what motivated him on that very first Palm Sunday. He was compelled by love. He had a love that was the Father's love and a love for people. He was compelled by love and he was compelled to love. And that love was demonstrated in the way he gave so much. How, how many of you know that being generous is a very good thing for a follower of Christ because that proves that, that we have him living within us? When we're generous and we're gracious and we're patient and we're forgiving and, and we extend a, an olive branch or a $20 bill, whatever it might be, a, a moment to listen, a moment to pray with someone, those are all signs of love because as we say so frequently, love gives. If somebody ever says, hey, what gives? That old little phrase, Quay, love gives. And God gives because God is love. And so I, I remind you this morning, just as a little bit of a part of the intro, that, that, that God loves, and Jesus was compelled to go to Jerusalem to face his destiny there because of a love. God 
gave his son because he loves, and Jesus gave his life because he loves. John 3, 16, you know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus that we have the chance to place our faith in him. Mark 10, 45, that says about Jesus that he didn't come to be served, but love serves. He came to serve, and, and to what? To give his very life. For what purpose? As a ransom, a ransom, a payment for many. I hope you realize that you're one of the many today. Luke 9 verse 10 tells us that Jesus, the Son of Man, came to seek and to save that which was lost. Who was lost? Jesus came to find us when we were lost in our sin and wandering around helpless like a sheep without a good shepherd. So, so all of these dynamics compelled Jesus to go to Jerusalem. So it would only be fitting today. In fact, why don't you stand with me? We're going to read this Palm Sunday triumphal entry passage. Stand with me. Luke chapter 19, verses 29 through 42. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you're going to find a colt tied there. No one's ever ridden that colt. Untie it, bring it here. If someone asks you why you're untying it, just tell them the Lord needs it. So they went, and they found it, and they were untying it. Verse 33 tells us its owners did ask, Hey, what's the deal? What gives? And they said, God gives, because he loves. No, they didn't say that. They said, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt, they put Jesus on it, and he went along, and people were, were spreading their cloaks along the road there. Verse 37, he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully praising God in loud voices like we did here this morning, hallelujah, for who he is and what he's done. All the miracles they had seen Jesus perform. And verse 38 tells us that they shouted, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Hey, how about we read verse 38 together? Can you do that with me? Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd, these are religious people who were kind of looking with a critical point of view, said to Jesus, hey, teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, tell them to stop shouting that. Jesus said to them, I tell you, Pastor Edie read earlier, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. I think it was Jesus' way of putting them in their place and making a statement. Verse 41, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, e, if, he said if you, even you, Jerusalem, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Lord, this Palm Sunday, we thank you for your love that compelled you to enter Jerusalem and to give your life for us. We ask you now, open the eyes of our hearts today so that we will be driven and compelled by what drives you. In your name and for your glory, we pray, Jesus. Everyone said amen. You may be seated. Two primary objectives today, number one, to notice what compels Jesus, number two, to pray that that will also compel us as we leave this place. I'm going to use Matthew chapter 9, familiar passage, verses 35 through 38 as sort of a launching platform as we think about and notice what compelled Jesus to go to Jerusalem and face the cross to take on those nails and that crown of thorns. Again, it's a familiar passage, verse 35 through 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Verse 36, we've thought about this over the last month or so. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed, they were helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So again, some observations here today. I'm going to give you three of them. Some of you were all too familiar with the, with the philosophy of using cliff notes last week. 
You do remember when you cheated in high school. And so I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version right off the bat. I'm going to give you three simple points based on the passage we just read. Jesus is, is compelled by the sight of the crowd, the suffering and the sin of the crowd, and the size of the crowd. And again, we're, we're observing and we're saying, Lord, we want to be compelled. We want to better understand your heart and your point of view, but we want to become more like you. Amen, church? And so what we see is Jesus going town to town, sharing the gospel, healing people. He's motivated with sympathy, empathy, and compassion. He's doing something to lift the load, and he's compelled by that compassion. He's looking at the crowd. The first thing is the sight of the crowd. He sees the crowd, and I would just challenge you to begin to see the crowd around you. We, we live in a place that's not desolate. We don't live out in the wilderness. We live in northeast Ohio. There are thousands of people nearby at any one point in time. And Jesus sees the crowd. The difference is, I think, Jesus is motivated by compassion because he doesn't just simply see a crowd. He, he saw people. Can I just challenge you with that? In, in your hustle and your bustle to slow down, to ask the Lord to help you see individuals. I was at Cleveland Brown Stadium a month or so ago with John Ross, John Ziegler, Gary Petrick watching the Buckeyes and the Wolverines play ice hockey. And there were, we had a great time, and thousands of people there at Cleveland Brown Stadium, you know, tens of thousands, 40 some thousand were there. I didn't really notice a lot of individuals, to be honest. I just saw the masses of people. But what strikes me it, is that Jesus was compelled, while there may have been a stadium full of people, he was compelled by you and me. And them and they. He was compelled by the he and she. He was compelled by the individual. You see, it's not what he saw. It's how he saw them. Mark 10, let me give you a few examples. Mark chapter 10, verse 13 and 14, because I think we can relate with the disciples of Jesus' day. I think sometimes we see the stadium full when Jesus says, I, I noticed the person in section 132, row A H H seat 7, and, and I know who you are, and I know where you are, and I know how much money you paid. You got ripped off to get into this place, and, and yet you can't pay your rent, but you're here paying you know, $80 to watch a team lose, and, and all these things. And so Mark chapter 10, just relate. We want to just relate. People in this situation, there's a crowd of people. All these scenarios, there's a crowd of people. And Jesus is, is in the midst of them. He's teaching. There's this, there's this draw to Jesus. And people in the crowd are bringing their children into the midst of Jesus, into the crowd. And, and they're hopeful because they recognize Jesus is something special. Jesus is someone special. And, and they want Jesus to bless their children. And it's just interesting what you see there in verse 13, that the, the, the disciples, and I think this sometimes can be our tendency, the disciples rebuked the people, probably parents, wanting to bring their children to Jesus. I mean, again, the, the word rebuke, it's to say, stop it. That's far enough. Like, don't bother us. Like, go play somewhere, right? And the disciples are, 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 are seeing a massive crowd, but Jesus is seeing a little child and putting value on that little one. Where they've been, where they are, and the plans and the purposes and the God-given destiny he has for them. The verses that follow, it's amazing. Jesus, the Bible tells us in verse 14, was indignant with the disciples' observation and words of rebuke. Here's a massive crowd, but Jesus sees the little one as has value. This little one's not a bother. And the disciples are saying, stop it, go back, go, you know, go find something to play with, whatever. And, and Jesus says, no, bring the children here. Bring, bring that child. And he embraces the child like he would you or me when, when we come in humility and in faith. He embraces the child. The Bible tells us he puts his hands on the child and blesses the child. There, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people, but Jesus prioritized in the midst of the crowd, blessing the individual. It's beautiful. It, it's so easy to think like the disciples. 
I want to become more like Jesus. We see a, a similar parallel in, a little later in Mark chapter 10. Beginning in verse 46 and following, there's again a crowd and Jesus, his, his followers, literally says there's a large crowd, they're leaving Jericho and there's a man, he's a beggar on the side of the road, he's known as Blind Bartimaeus. He begs because that's his full-time occupation, he, he doesn't have the ability to see, therefore his, his opportunities are limited to provide for himself, he depends on the goodness, the generosity of others, and, and in this case he hears Jesus is passing by, he says, Jesus have mercy on me, and verse 48, guess how the disciples and the people in the crowd responded, they, it's the same word that they treated the children with, they, they rebuked him, in other words, stop it, hush up. Don't interfere with what, what need the big picture. Aren't you glad that Jesus is macro and micro? And Jesus stopped, and to everybody's surprise, he called Bartimaeus. Verse 52, you see Jesus healed him, restored his vision, and welcomed the one into the faith journey along with Jesus. The examples go on and on. I'll just tell you about another one real quick because it's so clear in Matthew 15, you can read it later, but Jesus was again compelled to go to the cross by a passion for hurting people. There's a Canaanite woman, she's begging Jesus, heal my daughter. The people are saying, hey, send her away. It's that rebuke again. And Jesus, we looked at her last week, was compelled with compassion to stop the parade to lean into her need, to honor her acknowledgement of his ability, her faith, her humble stance. And he healed her daughter, set her free. While other people saw people and the crowd as an inconvenience, Jesus saw those people as souls needing saved. Jesus was compelled to go to the cross, take on Calvary by a passion for hurting and lost people, Lord, give us your heart. The second observation that I see that compelled Jesus is the suffering of the crowds that's related to the sin in the crowd. You know, suffering in the world is always related to our sinful nature and our fallen nature. That's, I'm so thankful. That's why Jesus came to, to reckon all of that. Matthew chapter 9, we'll go back to our platform that we jumped off of, verse 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were what? They were harassed and helpless. They were harassed and helpless. So, so Jesus sees the crowd, he sees this room, he sees the stadium, he sees you online, and yet he is in tune with your suffering. He is in tune with your sin. And, and Jesus recognizes that there are people in the crowd then, just like there may be people in the crowd today or might be in the crowd next Sunday who feel helpless. They feel harassed by others, harassed by circumstances. Murphy's Law, so to speak. And they're miserable, they're dejected, they're distressed. And again, you might be there today, and I know it's not a popular thing to admit, but it's, it's always a wholesome, wholesome opportunity to admit that to Jesus because he can help you. And so Jesus is feeling, he's compelled to go to the cross on that Palm Sunday because he sees that people are hurting. They are without a Savior. I'll give you some verses, you can read them later. He sees that people are without forgiveness and they're carrying the weight and the burden of, of their, their sin and its consequences. He sees that they don't know what it's like to have the almighty, powerful God also be a close friend or a, a good shepherd who can lead, guide, and direct them. That these people don't understand what it's like when life gets crazy to have a refuge and a strength that you can go to the Lord. These people don't have a future and a hope that's glorious in eternity that's called heaven. And Jesus sees the heart of these people as they they are wandering in their darkness, aiming to find some sense of satisfaction and significance, and he has a heart for them. He's compelled, I must go to the cross for him, for her, possibly for you, just possibly. And so we see the reflection of the forecast from the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53. 
How parallel to what we're reading here in Matthew chapter 9 that Jesus is in tune and, and he has a heart for. The Bible tells us, as Jesus was saying, these sheep are like without a shepherd. They're harassed and helpless. Isaiah said hundreds of years prior about the coming Messiah, we are all like sheep and we've gone astray. In other words, we're all helpless and harassed. Each of us has turned our own way and the Lord has laid on him who is him. That would be Jesus, future, laid on him the iniquity of all of us. That's why we sing songs that we sang today. That's why we come to a place like this and gather in his name and under his authority and we seek him and we celebrate him and we dare to ask him for mercy and grace, but we, we don't have to be afraid to because he's already demonstrated it. He's already given it. You back up one verse, Isaiah 53 verse 5 tells us exactly what Jesus aimed to accomplish. And this is the, the, the prophecy. But he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions, our shortcomings. He was crushed, think of the cross, for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus was compelled to enter Jerusalem, to shed his blood by a passion for hurting, lost, sin-filled people. Lord, give us your heart. Jesus was compelled by the size of the crowds. I, I find it, again, interesting that Jesus could see the individual. He knows you, he knows me, just like we know you and me, right? We, we know ourselves pretty good. Jesus knows us probably better. And, and Jesus was moved by the masses of people as well as the individual. Macro and minor. Matthew 9, 36, he saw the crowds. He had compassion on them. All these people. It's like us at the Brown Stadium and Jesus has compassion on all those people. I don't even know these people. I mean, there's so many of them. I, I just, you know, want to pay my $18 for a hot dog and enjoy the loss and go home without, you know, getting stuck in traffic. And Jesus is in tune with all the masses. I believe Jesus was deeply moved because there were so many people in need. They were in need of what only he can provide. Masses. Countless of not an individual, not just a family, not just a clan, not not just a big like a whole community. So many people in need of a shepherd. So many people in need of a savior. I believe Jesus hears his words in Matthew eight twenty four. Felt these things. This is what compelled him to go to to Calvary. If you do not believe that I am He, that I've come from above, that I am the Messiah, you will indeed die in your sins. Those are the words of Jesus. When he looks at the individual, he measures the heart and he says, do, do they qualify? And Well, if they're a sinner, they're, they're disqualified and they'll die in their sin. So Jesus came and became the sacrifice, the ransom, because he loved, he gave. And he went to Jerusalem because he was compelled by the needs in people's hearts. Aren't you glad? While we were sinners, Christ died for us, the Bible tells us. Not once we cleaned up, once we, not once we knew how bad we were, how far we needed to go. I'm a sinner. I admit it. Save me, Jesus. The Bible tells us he does. He's that good. Jesus was compelled by the size of the crowd. It got me thinking, there are thousands of people within a few miles of where we worship today. Many of them, thousands of them are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, souls without a savior, and the Lord sees them all. I wonder if we do. 
I wonder if we care if men and women live and die without Christ the way Christ does. Will we pray for them? Will we invite them? Will we help them find Jesus? Do we care? I I pray that our hearts will be compelled with what compelled and what compels the heart of Jesus. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, Jeremiah the prophet. This is something that brings us comfort if we are followers of Jesus and recipients of his grace and we understand this gospel message, this good news we're discussing today. This is what Jeremiah penned. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. See, there are a lot of people that don't have that hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. You see, if, if you have found his love and, and you have accepted his love and you have accepted his sacrifice, you're able to bank on this promise. You're able to lean into his compassion. You're able to lean into the fact that not only is he the God of the universe, the creator, but he's your redeemer. He's paid the price for you and he loves you and he's there for you. And you find hope in that. But so many people in Northeast Ohio don't yet know this freeing truth. Some of them live under your roof. Some of them work under and in the building where you work. Some of them go to school where you go to school. And they don't know. They don't understand. They just understand there's a religion out there and it's split up into a lot of fragments. And this is just one angle of it. That's all they really know. They don't really know Jesus the way some of us have learned to know Jesus. But Jesus wants them to. Jesus wants them to know him. Jesus wants them to know that he had a decision to make on a Sunday, days before he would be crucified and humbled on the cross, that he decided to go to Jerusalem. He was compelled and driven and motivated out of a love for them. Thousands of people within just a few miles of where we sit today. Those people compelled Jesus to go. And so therefore Luke 9, 51 states it this way as Jesus' ministry was wrapping up. As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. That's a strong word. It's a word that implies I'm determined. I know what I have to do. I know why I have to do it. I know how it has to be done. And I'm going to deny myself for their sake. Jesus was compelled by our need for help. The sight of the crowds, the size of the crowds, the suffering and the results of sin in the hearts of people in the crowds. Jesus was compelled by his love to seek and save those who were and might still be lost. Can I get an amen? When I hone my attention into these truths, I just might sense conviction you know, feeling bad about the fact that there are days that I go by and I probably am not compelled to see people the way Jesus does. I confess that to you. Now, I don't always fail. <laughs> there, there are moments where I sense the Lord is helping me. I've asked him to help me. I see people. I'll catch eyes with somebody and I'll, just, I'll be drawn. I know they need Jesus. I'll go and I'll have a moment. The Holy Spirit will lead God and direct us if we'll look for, we pray for, and we look for those moments. He will. How many of you know that's true? And I think it's, it's healthy for us sometimes to admit we get caught up in a lot of good things, let alone the bad things, that preoccupy our mind's eye and our value system. And we're hurrying through life, and there are people who compelled Jesus, people in need. Jesus went to the cross for, that we're just passing right on by. Lord, help us be compelled with what compels you. 
Jesus addressed this in our platform passage, chapter 9 of Matthew, the final two verses. Let's just look at them one more time because it's the heart of Jesus. This is why he did what he did. Jesus said to his disciples, there is a harvest out there. The harvest is plentiful, but there are so few workers. Ask the Lord of the harvest. Send out workers into his harvest field. In case you're, the Bible is new to you, what Jesus is doing, he's always speaking to them in languages they'll understand, illustrations that they can get, and he's basically always helping them understand that, that he has come to reach people. And, and he recruited his disciples like he, he's recruited you. That's why, that's why you're following Jesus. He's recruited you. He's drawn you. He's saved you. If not yet, he wants to forgive you and cleanse you, save you today from your sin and its consequences. And then he wants to recruit you to be part of his work. And, and he would help the disciples like he wants to help us now understand. Like, hey, they were fishermen. So he'd say, just like you caught fish, I, Jesus would say, I have come. And you're going to help me in our, in our ministry to honor the Father by helping save. We're going to catch people. Right? And so sometimes he'd say, hey, you're, you're familiar with agriculture. You understand the principle of, 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 of planting seeds, and there's a season for harvest. And Jesus said, there's a brand new era that's beginning right now with, with my life and now my death and then my resurrection and ascension and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is all that Jesus has in mind. And he's telling his disciples, there's going to be a great harvest because I've been compelled. I've come for the harvest. I've come, and the harvest is made up of people. I just, he's trying to help them understand that, that there is a time to reap the harvest and bring them into the barns well, the, well, the, where they'll be protected from the snow and the storms, right? And, and, and the Lord is basically saying, we want, we want to help people come into the kingdom of heaven, heaven's barns. We, we've got a, my father's house has many rooms, Jesus said, John 14. I'm going there to prepare a place for who? For the harvest. And so Jesus says to his disciples, there are people that you will rub shoulders with. I believe he would say to Calvary Assembly of God, you will rub shoulders with every, every saved person, every sinner saved by grace. You will rub shoulders with, you will, you will pass by people who, who I died for, I went to Jerusalem for, I went up Calvary's Hill for, I took nails on, I took all these things for them. And please, if you are truly mine, represent me well. Be compelled to share me with some. And God, and maybe that's where we start today, we say, Lord, forgive us for the times we don't. Forgive me for the times I am too preoccupied with other things, and they may not even be bad things, but I am too busy. And I see that person looking at me, and they look like they're in need, and I don't have time for someone like that. Why don't they get a job? Silver and gold have I none, but what I give to you. That needs to be the heart of God's people. We need to slow down and pause and look people in the eye the way Jesus would look at a child and say, come here, I want to bless you in Jesus' name. Lord, help us. I want to pray for you. I'm going to give you some ways to pray. I just want you, would you just bow your heads just for a moment? I feel the Holy Spirit just kind of pressing on us a little bit in a good way. Lord, this Palm Sunday, we thank you for your love that compelled you to enter Jerusalem and to give your life for us. We invite the precious Spirit of God to work out of us our selfish tendencies and work into our hearts the heart of Jesus, the compassion of Christ for individuals and crowds, for cities, for suburbs, for workplaces, for schools. I'm going to invite you to pray in a couple of ways, and I'm going to actually invite our prayer ministry teams to get into place so that they're ready to serve the congregation. If you're heading to one of those places, prayer team, you can do that now. Here's my first appeal. If everything we're saying today that Jesus came to accomplish, if you're thinking, man, that resonates with me. Jesus did that for me. Heads are still bowed. We're still in an attitude of prayer and self-reflection, letting God speak to our hearts. And if, if you're thinking, man, if Jesus came 
to help me. I, I need help, and, and I feel like I've been lost and lost in my sin, and man, life has not been easy, and I've been self-serving, and if Jesus came to save me, I, I, I need saving. And Hosanna, save me now, Jesus. If that is you, would you just, again, people are praying. This is an, an opportunity for you to respond. I'm going to lead you in a prayer in a second. Would you just raise a hand anywhere in the room? You're like, that's me. I need to commit my life to Jesus. I need to recommit my life to Christ. See a hand there, right there, there. Yeah, God sees. Anyone else? Just an opportunity to say, Lord, man, I, I need saving. If you did all that for me, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. Now, I want you to just make this your prayer. I want to pray with you. Lord, thank you for taking on the cross like you did to bring me hope so that my sin can be forgiven. I admit I'm a sinner. I fall short. Christ, you are holy, and you died as a ransom payment out of love. You were so generous to take on the cross for me. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving me your son. I accept Christ. Forgive me of my sin. Save me of my sin's consequences. Save me from eternal damnation. And not just save me, God, but now shepherd me forward. I want to live my life for you. I want my life to count. I want to deliver you to others. Fill me with your peace and, and your purpose. I want to be consumed, God. I, I, I want to be compelled with godly things. If you prayed that prayer in just a moment, I, you see people in all four corners of the room this morning, two in the front left and right, and two in the rear left and right. And, and before you leave, if you raised a hand, I, I want really... I encourage you, please, stop by one of these groups. These prayer people would love to pray with you. Just pray over you, God's blessing. Before you leave, just stop and let them pray with and for you. Now, there are others in the room, and you're sensing God's heart for people near where you live and where you work and where you study. And you want to play your part to introduce people to Jesus. You had a little bit of conviction today. You were uncomfortable with the fact that Jesus was driven to save the lost, and, and, and he went to the cross to do so, and, and we're not driven just to slow down and hear someone's story and listen and care and pray or invite them to a, a place like this so they can hear more about Christ. And, and you're thinking there are people, and people need Jesus, and Jesus prayed for those workers in the harvest, and I want to be a worker in that harvest. I, I am available, and you're saying, Lord, I, I am willing. In fact, if that's you, would, would you just even just stand if that's you, and you're saying, Lord, fill me with your spirit to be a witness for Jesus this week wherever I go. If you're tired of being a casual Christian, if you're saying, Lord, I'm sorry, I want to be more intentional, you're saying, Lord, I, I, I recognize that I need you. Uh, I need the ability to recognize open doors and open opportunities and open hearts and fertile soil. I need the wisdom of God to know what to say and when to say it and how to represent Jesus well, how to love like Jesus loved me. I need the boldness to offer, to pray with people. I need the boldness to invite someone to a worship service. If that's you, you're saying, Lord, I'm standing as a way of saying, I'm stepping up. I'm available. I want to be an answer to that prayer. I want to be a worker in the harvest. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd fill us, anoint us to serve you well. Give us the eyes to see. And now we need to pray for those who will say yes to the invitation to consider Jesus. You, I'm look, holding in my hand dozens and dozens, probably a hundred and some names that you submitted as a church, people who need Jesus. And so we are praying for those people to receive an invitation, to say yes to our invitation to join us here at this church. Probably next Sunday we're believing they're going to join us, Lord. We're praying for receptive hearts to our invite. We're praying for, for these people, our loved ones, to, to be honest with themselves and honest before God. We're praying that faith will, will grow within them and just kind of surge within them to say yes to Jesus' gift of forgiveness, yes to eternal life. We're praying in Jesus' name and authority we command Satan and his devils to take their hands off of our loved ones, our friends, our neighborhoods, our teammates, our coworkers. We're believing for their salvation. Jesus died for them. We will represent them. The Holy Spirit has come to empower us to do so. And we believe for the harvest is ripe. 
Now, friends, today, I, I know you're praying and you're processing, and, but before you go today, I want you to know that our prayer teams are, are ready to pray with you. They are ready to pray for you. For any of these reasons, if you prayed to accept and commit your life to Christ today, stop and pray with somebody in these corners. If you have a need in your body, we believe that Jesus is so able. He is still the same God. He still heals today. Maybe it's a need in your body, a need in your mind. Maybe it's a circumstantial need. It's your marriage. Maybe you just need wisdom. You don't know how to raise your kids, whatever. Stop and pray with these folks. Maybe you're just hungry for more of God and you're thinking, I just need God's presence. I need to sense him. I need him to to go with me. I need his spirit to fill me and empower me so I can represent Jesus well. Stop and let these folks pray with you. I want to just tell you that if you're relatively new, Bridget and I are so glad you're here and we want to meet you. We'll be out in the foyer off to the left there in that little nook and we'll be there next Sunday. When you bring guests next Sunday and you bring friends and loved ones who don't normally come, We're hoping that they will stop and receive prayer, accept Christ if they need to do that, amen, and then come meet me and Bridget. We'll be in a a meet the pastor area off to the left there. If you're a guest today, we want to say hello to you out there, but please do not miss your moment to connect with Jesus in prayer before you come meet us in the foyer. Everybody, as Pastor Edie said it, invite cards. People need Jesus. So if you need prayer for any of these opportunities, of course you're welcome to linger on your own and just press in and surrender to the Lord. But if you need prayer, all these folks are available. We are expecting next week many of these people to respond favorably to your invitation to hear the gospel message and to say yes to Jesus. Can I get an amen? And I'm praying, we are praying together this week for the harvest because it is ripe. Do I have any workers in the house? Amen. All glory to Jesus. Lord, you're going to get what you came for in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. amen.